Well, good afternoon or, or evening or whatever it is, wherever you are. Uh, my name is George Pantelis. I am at the University of Louisville in Louisville, Kentucky, and I'm both in the Department of Cardiac Surgery and in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. And I've been doing NASA-sponsored research actually ever since I was a student. So I've been very fortunate to have that opportunity and very fortunate to be able to continue it. Um, I've done lots of different things, and I will go through a wee bit of an introduction and eventually get to the topic uh, that I have. Now, um, of course, most introductions have a disclaimer, and let's, let's see if I can get my slides to cooperate. Um, do you see my first disclosure slide? Yes. Okay. Good, just wanted to make sure that you're seeing what I'm hoping you're seeing. Uh, so I don't have any financial entanglements with any of the information that's being presented, at least not yet. Um, NASA is the key organization that's supported this work, but I've had support from NIH and other organizations as well, for which I'm very thankful. Um, you'll find out that I uh, talk too much. I try not to keep you from your plans today. Uh, in fact, this was my third grade report card. Um, if you look at the grades on the left, it's clearly stuff that most of us were, were made of with, with decent grades. Uh, but what's important to this presentation is if you look at that one line, I excelled at the one topic, I got checks every time. And that was talks too much. So if my parents were here today, they would tell you that I'm a much better speaker than I was in the third grade. But unfortunately for you, I still talk too much. But at least I hope what I have to say will be of interest. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever designed, built, and flown model rockets, but that's certainly what I did when I was a teenager and into college, and even today when I get a chance. Uh, but this is an example. And then um, I was also a volunteer at the Science Museum, and during Apollo 11, we even had a chance to use a full-scale Apollo command module to uh, demonstrate to the visiting public what was going on in different parts of the mission. Um, I actually started out as an engineering student um, and then had an experience that got me to direct my energies in engineering, still in engineering, but toward medical stuff. But this is an example of a Mach 3 supersonic wind tunnel that I developed at one time. And here you can see what's called a Schlieren photograph to see the shock wave um, formation on a pinhead that I sculpted to look like an Apollo command module during re-entry after returning from the moon. But I, I also like taking pictures. In fact, I was the photographer for the school yearbook and newspaper. And that got me involved in a very unique opportunity with some of my classmates that changed my trajectory. And that was my, my classmates in the honors biology class not only got a full curriculum, but they had to do a special project. And this was back in the fall of 1967, when organ transplantation was just starting to happen. In fact, uh, heart transplants hadn't happened yet, but they decided to study organ transplantation for their project. They wanted to attempt to do a heart transplant on a bullfrog. Well, they, they did their first one. It was a very educational experience, pardon the pun, but the frog croaked. Um, and all they had to show for it were two very bad black and white Polaroid photographs. So uh, they, as they prepared for their next one, they asked me to come in and take pictures. And as I was coming to their planning sessions, it occurred to me that a lot of their challenges had engineering solutions. And that's what got me turned on to using training in engineering to work on medical problems, whether it was applying concepts of fluid mechanics to understanding blood flow and respiratory flow, or to use concepts of design and fabrication that you get in engineering to create new medical devices. And so lo and behold, 10 years later, I'm actually the surgeon uh, working on one of my research animals and planning sensors in and around the heart of this animal, which then a week later after recovery, I was doing all kinds of cardiovascular experiments. Then I was uh, at the University of Utah for several years, uh, worked with the artificial heart program there, 
and uh, here you can see me getting ready in the operating room for an artificial heart implant. Uh, but I also uh, can, had the chance to continue NASA-sponsored activity. Uh, but in the process, I, I worked with several artificial heart and ventricular assist device patients, and I've gotten a chance to fly on the zero-G airplane developing experiments that eventually flew in space. Now, it turns out that just coincidentally, all of my teams wear red. I don't know if you have any particular affiliations. Um, I did all my training at Ohio State, which is a university in Columbus, Ohio. And then I was on the faculty at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City for 17 years, uh, where they, they wore uh, crimson and white. Uh, and that's where I did a lot of the, my initial artificial heart and ventricular assist device work, both in the lab and working with patients. And I've been at the University of Louisville now, which wears uh, scarlet and black, um, do continuing more of that work and continuing more of my NASA sponsored work. But I'm also very involved with the Red Cross and with the uh, American Heart Association and some of my volunteer work. That's a whole nother story that I'd be happy to share with you some other time if anybody's interested. Uh, but most of my initial work in looking at spaceflight was looking at cardiovascular function. Uh, and in fact, at one time, the Hubble Space Telescope got this picture, which to me certainly looks like a star cluster that forms the shape of a heart. But uh, to do it using that as a takeoff, this is one of the artificial hearts that I helped develop. Um, you can see it here inside a, an experiment setup, which was installed inside an experiment canister, which flew in the cargo bay of the space shuttle. Uh, back in 1997 and 1998. Uh, what we were looking at was changes in cardiac diastolic function or the filling phase of the heart cycle and uh, wondering why some of the results that came back from early echocardiographic studies showed that the hearts first got bigger and pumped much more blood per beat than they did on the ground. Um, but then with subsequent days in the flight, by three or four days in the flight, they actually filled less and pumped less per beat, but the heart rates increased, so the overall blood flow delivery was still adequate to maintain astronaut health, but we wondered why that was happening. And one of the things that I proposed was that the presence of hydrostatic pressure, which is normally in our heart and is directly related to gravity and, or acceleration, the 1G environment that we live in, that if you go into hypergravity, the, the hydrostatic pressure head between the base and the apex of the heart or the top and the bottom of the heart would increase. And if you go into zero G, um, it should essentially go to zero. And this is some data that you see of that hydrostatic pressure um, and the pressure difference between the base and the apex of the heart uh, that we were able to collect during pathfinding parabolic flights uh, on the NASA KC-135 aircraft that led early um, confirmation of our hypothesis about the hydrostatic pressure in the heart going essentially to zero uh, when you're in a weightless state, as you would expect. And then we also looked at what's called a ventricular function curve, and that is the, the stroke volume or the output per beat at various levels of the pressure of filling here in the 1G upright versus uh, 0G that was data recorded on the shuttle. And it, as we predicted that this curve would shift to the right, approximately the average effect of the hydrostatic pressure in the, in the heart. So it, it gave us uh, some understanding of the interaction between acceleration environments, and in this case, the function of the heart and the cardiovascular system. Uh, but this, this happens to be a very exciting time to be interested in space flight. And this is one of the NASA pictorials from a few years ago, talking about going from low Earth orbit with the space station to the higher powered rockets, such as the Space Launch System, to then first orbit the moon and eventually landing on the moon. And then eventually using that as a, 
stepping stone to exploring asteroids and possibly even Mars. And, and the other thing that's important to point out, I, I don't know where all of you are, but this is a very global effort. Um, there are many international partners on the International Space Station, and there will be international partnerships with efforts to go to the moon and other places. And that's represented here in the global exploration roadmap. Um, coming up, uh, hopefully in just about a week, if all goes well, we will see the first launch of what's called the Space Launch System. And, and in fact, as we're visiting today out on launch pad 39A, there is the Space Launch System with the Orion spacecraft on top. And if things go well a week from Monday, um, the spacecraft is going to launch from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It'll go into low Earth orbit. If things check out well, it will go out of low Earth orbit toward the moon. It'll go past the moon. It'll eventually come back and orbit the moon several times, and then it'll return to Earth. And there are three instrumented mannequins on board to try to gain information about the radiation environment, the acceleration environment, and other things that very directly will impact the astronauts who will fly in that. And if, if this mission goes well in about two years, they're expecting to repeat the mission with four astronauts on board. So possibly in 2024 will be the first opportunity since 1972 for astronauts to return to the environment near the moon. And then uh, if things continue to proceed on schedule, possibly a year or two later, the first crew of astronauts will actually land back on the moon. So this is an, a very ex exciting time if you're interested in spaceflight and spaceflight research. Um, looking ahead toward resources for healthcare, as a lunar station is established over the next several years after that first landing, um, it will be uh, made up of a few connecting modules, and there will be rovers and other things to get the job done. There will not be a module dedicated to healthcare. Uh, so you, you'll see the classic repurposing of parts of a module to provide healthcare to astronauts who need some kind of care. And it probably won't be until many, many decades into the future that we'll actually see a highly organized colony like that and maybe uh, one of these little domes will actually be the clinic for the entire colony. In the meantime, um, there's still gonna need to be healthcare. And because we are going out of low earth orbit, the crews are gonna have to be more self-sufficient. And that's some of the topics that I'm looking at. Um, this is a pictorial that indicates several of the different changes that occur in the body. Uh, with extended exposure to reduced gravity or, or zero G altogether. Um, and then this shows uh, in flow charts, uh, kind of an engineering approach to trying to describe that and what things might be done to provide healthcare. And one of the labs at NASA has come up with what's called the integrated medical model. And what they've done is they've through statistical methods, uh, identified a hundred different medical conditions that have some probability of showing up during an exploration spaceflight. And there are 26 or 27 of these where surgical treatment would normally be included uh, in part of the treatment scheme. So that, that raises the question, uh, how would you do surgical care and, and how much of that is reasonable to do during an exploration spaceflight. Um, when the International Space Station was first considered as uh, what was called Space Station Freedom back in the 70s, it had one whole module that was dedicated to healthcare and medical research that got pared down to uh, two racks inside one of the modules now that's currently orbiting the Earth. So uh, in, in orbit, care is limited. If they need to, a current crew member can get back to a hospital on the Earth in about six hours. But if you're halfway to Mars or if you're on the moon, um, that is not an option because to, to prepare for a return flight, even from the moon, is gonna, 
it'll be five to six days before the crew member gets back. And depending on what the medical condition is, that may not be an acceptable delay in treatment. On the other hand, there is this artist conception of a really fancy robotic surgical suite that's a part of a orbiting space station. Um, if this happens, it's probably going to be long beyond my lifetime. So we need to think about what's, what's more realistic uh, in the current future. Now, one way to present this is to look at a hypothetical case report. And so let's imagine that there's an astronaut that develops abdominal pain and there's uh, nausea, vomiting, and uh, fever. Uh, lab results indicate a low-grade leukocytosis, meaning an increase in white blood cells with a probable diagnosis of appendicitis. Uh, there is pain and tenderness uh, localized to the lower right quadrant of the abdomen. If any of you have ever had appendicitis, I'm sure you know that experience all too well. Um, and an ultrasound image confirms abnormal dilated structure in the lower right quadrant, which is consistent with the diagnosis of appendicitis. So the astronaut is initially treated with antibiotics such as zosin and intravenous fluids such as lactated ringers, resulting in partial resolution of symptoms, which is a good thing. And what you would hope is that they would continue to get better. But in this particular case, within a week, the astronaut develops a high fever and increasing uh, lower right quadrant pain, which means that the antibiotics and intravenous fluid treatment wasn't sufficient. So, and or repeat the ultrasound imaging, and there's an abscess now around the appendix, which means that it's ruptured and there's infectious material around it. So the crew medical officer uh, prepares the abdomen for abscess drainage. And to do that, um, the surgical assistant prepares the instruments that will be needed and aims the ultrasound probe um, at the location of the target. Uh, with ultrasound guidance, the crew medical officer inserts a needle into the lower right quadrant um, under local anesthesia. And then uh, needle aspiration reveals pus, which is what you'd expect to find when a appendix has ruptured, and then a guide wire is slid through the needle to the abscess and the needle is removed. And then using a scalpel, the crew medical officer makes an incision along the wire and slides a drainage catheter to the abscess. Uh, the wire is withdrawn and suction is applied to the catheter draining the abscess in a slow process. Uh, antibiotics and suction are continued for about a week uh, when the drainage subsides, the catheter is removed. And then it's the small wound from the catheter heals with daily change of the dressing, which could be something as simple as a topical antibiotic in a Band-Aid. And then after that, with no return of symptoms, the astronaut returns to duty, which is the outcome you want. Like everything else, you need to fact check and look at what's what's the what are the details behind this example that I've just presented. First thing is the crew medical officer is not a surgeon, uh, but they are an astronaut who has pre-flight training and periodic in-flight training about the same as a um, emergency medical officer, and has some training in minimally invasive surgery. Uh, Parenthetically, a couple of historic uh, demonstrations of something similar. Uh, there was a seaman on board the USS Dragon during World War II in 1942. And it so happens a pharmacist made um, Wheeler Lips uh, had actually observed an appendectomy uh, previously in his career. And so um, he attempted to perform an appendectomy on this soldier because uh, they could not surface, they could not send the, the semen to a hospital to get treated. And you can see here this artist's depiction of what it was like um, when the appendectomy was in fact successfully performed. But uh, such a thing would not happen uh, on a current submarine. Um, in fact, it's 
typical that about twice a year, a submarine has to surface to have a helicopter come and take an afflicted seaman to a hospital back on the shore for the necessary treatment. Um, and then there is the example uh, from 1961, where there was a Russian, Russian surgeon who was part of a research team down in Antarctica. Uh, he started to have all the classic symptoms of appendicitis, which he did recognize. Um, he was also the only medical person on the crew at the time. So here you can see him uh, performing an appendectomy on himself, which was quite a chore, but fortunately the appendectomy was successful and he survived and eventually recovered. Uh, doing an appendectomy on yourself is something that's not recommended. But, you know, Antarctic is one extreme situation, like exploration spaceflight, being on a submarine is another one. And so it points out the need that the probability of things like this happening are not zero. And so it's good to be prepared for some kind of medical situation. Now, the next fact check is the medical surgical assistant is not a human crew member, but an interactive human inspired dexterous robot. Um, this is Robonaut 2, which was a robot that was developed at the robotics lab down at the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston to perform routine tasks. And in fact, Robonaut 2 has been on the space station twice. I believe Robonaut 2 is currently on the space station for the second opportunity to evaluate their function. But a few years ago, uh, with a grant from the Translational Research Institute for Space Health, which is sponsored by NASA, one of the things we had the opportunity to do was ask the question, could a human-inspired dexterous robot be trained to be a medical surgical assistant? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. And here you can see a, an example of uh, Jimmy Wu is playing the role of the surgeon gives Robonaut to a verbal command, just like a surgeon would ask their surgical assistant for one of three surgical instruments that are presented in front of the robot. What the robot does, in this case, Robonaut 2, is take that verbal command, interpret what it means, and then it goes to its pattern uh, recognition archives and searches for the pattern that it in, has interpreted has been requested. And then when that pattern has been identified, it then goes to its visual system to say, please find something that looks like this. And so it scans what's in front of it, identifies the object, and then eventually grasps it and hands it off. And that's what you see is that grasping it, and then here's handing it off to the surgeon who's requested it. Here's another example of Robonaut actually operating an ultrasound imaging probe and locating it on the abdomen where it needs to be and following commands to manipulate the probe in a particular orientation to get a better view. So this is something that may happen in the future. Um, the reality is Robonaut 2 could do these tasks, but this involves the processings of hundreds of thousands of steps for each command. And so the, it was a slow process. It was certainly not real time and it was not realistic currently for what you would need to have a successful surgical experience. But it's very realistic in the future to expect that there will be uh, vastly accelerated processors and processing schemes so that a human-inspired dexterous robot could essentially be a reasonable, um, real-time responsive uh, medical surgical assistant to a uh, spaceflight crew should the situation arise. So the next thing is, is that the CMO and the assistant used integrated augmented reality to see the anatomy. And, and that is to uh, actually have an overlay of the relevant anatomy on the patient. This is a picture of actually doing an appendectomy in a patient. Here, you can, this is a typical scene in the OR uh, with the surgeon and the surgical assistant. Uh, these are pictures from the camera inside the patient's abdomen and, and three different camera views outside. Um, we use this to create a very detailed training video uh, far beyond what you would normally find on, on the internet because 
we want to, we, we're going to need to provide additional information for the somewhat trained, but not a practice practicing clinical surgeon to perform the surgical experience. And then this could be augmented with um, augmented reality to further point out the relevant anatomy projected over the patient at the correct location. Um, another thing is that uh, the number 11 scalpel blade was manifested, but the scalpel handle and the drainage catheter were 3D printed just prior to the procedure. And here you can see an example of 3D printing hemostats, 3D printing scalpel handles, and 3D printing forceps. Uh, and with 3D printing, the, the heat of printing a plastic material such as polyurethane or PLA is such that when it's printed, it is sterile. And so if it's handled correctly and removed from the printer, in a sterile manner, it will remain sterile so that it could be put in a package until it's needed or taken directly into the operative field. Um, I'll point out one little detail here with the scalpel. This is a standard stainless steel number three surgical scalpel that's used in the OR all over the world. Um, and then this is the 3D printed version of it. Robonaut 2 could successfully identify this as the scalpel handle. But because it was so narrow, Robonaut 2 could not reliably grasp it. So if you've had experience with 3D printing, you know that it's pretty straightforward to change dimension in whatever CAD CAM design project uh, program that you're using. And so we created the identical handle, but with a handle three times as wide, but with less internal density, so that we didn't actually increase the mass of it. Um, but with that, Robonaut 2 could consistently identify it and grasp it and hand it off. And, and I point out the mass of this scalpel handle is one-sixth the mass of this handle. So it, as you know, in spaceflight, you try to minimize the amount of mass of things that you need to take. Um, another fact check, the procedure was conducted on a dining table in the crew quarters, not in a fancy surgical suite like you see in this artist's conception. And the reality is a table is a table is a table. Here you can see a table in one of the interconnect modules um, on the International Space Station. This is in the high fidelity trainer down in building nine at the NASA Johnson Space Center. But it can, it can be flipped out to extend the table. There's probably additional ex extenders and that could be brought into service as an operating table if you had to do some kind of procedure or a small surgical procedure on a crew member. And then when it's done, you clean it up, you decontaminate it, you fold it back up, and then you use it for whatever it's normally used. So in the next uh, 30 years or less, we might be going, well, we're certainly going back to the moon and possibly even to Mars. Now, you might think considering surgery is a bit fanciful, but in 2011, when the first NASA Space Technology Roadmap came out, in, in Section 6, which was Human Health and Performance, it even included this uh, one sec section of a sentence where medical assist robotics for a lapar laparoscopic surgery and a surgical suite with sterile closed-loop fluid and ventilation systems for trauma and other surgeries. So this is, this is one of the things that was anticipated for the next 15 to 20 years to support uh, exploration space missions, knowing that the crews, you couldn't, you just, it wouldn't be realistic to come back to Mars. Um, so again, this is the artist's conception, but we know that this is decades off for operating capability. So it's gonna be fairly simple, it's gonna be a readaptation of a room that's normally used for something else, but you're going to make it happen. Again, in the National Research Council report on the section on crew health that came out in 2014, uh, they identified the need for highly capable diagnostic and treatment equipment, including surgical facilities designed for operation in space and on the surface of the moon or Mars or wherever you're going. Um, and then in the, as I mentioned previously, in the uh, 
exploration medical capabilities, um, 2017 list of 100 medical conditions, up to seven, uh, excuse me, 27 of them might have surgical treatment as a part of the overall treatment. Um, and then even, even in the list of the integrated medical model 100 conditions, um, if you look at some of the risk assessments, uh, appendicitis was the 10th condition listed with a greater than 75% risk of emergency evacuation, if there was a chance to do an emergency evacuation. And it was number seven with a greater, greater than 90% risk of loss of crew life. So these kind of things uh, point out that they're, they're not insignificant. They may not be highly likely to happen, but the fact that they might occur can't be ignored. Um, and then curiously enough, the very first time the Translational Research Institute for Space Health put out a request for proposals, topic four that they wanted submissions on was in-flight surgical capabilities. So the possibility of doing uh, in-flight surgical work has, has been around for a long time. And like uh, many medical technologies, you need to develop new devices, new uh, diagnostic imaging monitoring devices, surgical tools and implants, new instructional methods, including augmented and virtual reality. There may be the need of creating new drugs and drug delivery, as well as researching medical phenomena. And then in particular for space flight, um, you have to be aware of the mass that's required, the electrical power required, the volume or the spaces it's gonna take up, the time to develop and use whatever this technology is, the cost to develop it, the cost to use it, the risk cost benefit associated with its use, as well as crew competency. So there's a lot of different things that you have to take into account. Now, for example, if you look at doing an appendectomy today, this is, this is a picture inside an operating room. This is a lot of stuff. And it's certainly not going to make it on a spacecraft. And then unfortunately, if you see sci-fi movies like Ender's Game, they show this very elaborate robot implanting uh, some kind of chip in the brain of a young crew member. That's, that's very good science fiction, but it's not the reality that we're working with right now. And again, we, we don't have this amazing surgical suite. Um, I mentioned that in, in 1984, when Space Station Freedom, which is the forerunner of the space station was about, there was a whole ma um, health maintenance facility module. And, and uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Bruce Houchins, who was both a mechanical engineer and a general surgeon, developed this deployable table that could be used for surgery and other procedures. And he tested out in parabolic spaceflight. And uh, he wrote that it could be done uh, but the details are in the appropriate equipment and the protocols which need to be worked out. Uh, in the 90s, uh, my colleagues, Roger Billica and <clears throat> Campbell and, and uh, Johnson um, worked out uh, demonstrating during parabolic flight that you could do some laparoscopic surgical procedures. But again, it's, it's still going to take a lot of equipment. So the need to simplify this is going to be required. Curiously enough, the only documented human surgical procedure performed to date was on a zero-G flight uh, sponsored by the European Space Agency, where they looked at removing a small surface lesion from uh, the surface of a willing volunteer. Uh, and it was doable, but obviously um, working in the environment where gravity is absent adds challenge, but as long as you prepare for it and you have experience working there, it can be done. Um, Andy Kirkpatrick, uh, who's uh, currently down in Florida, um, and Tim Broderick, I'm sorry, Andy's in Calgary up in Canada, and Tim Broderick is in Florida. They did a series of flights on the Canadian Space Agency Falcon 50 aircraft, um, again, looking at other issues of doing minimally invasive surgery, for example, um, how much insufflation pressure do you inflate the abdomen with to uh, 
make the structures that you need, like an appendix or a gallbladder, make them easily uh, more visible and easier to work on. And, and they came up with the conclusion that, that gas insufflation will still be required, uh, but possibly not as much. And then a few other observations that indicate that it will be done, but it, it still has some challenges. Uh, less insufflation may be needed, but it's still going to be needed. Um, and then additional reduced gravity experiments uh, with the appropriate animal model are going to be needed to refine this. And, and should we even look at different insufflation gases? Right now, it's used clinically as CO2 because it's readily absorbed and has uh, doesn't have the problem of possible air embolus and those consequences. But helium has been considered, air has even been considered. So these are topics for future research. And then a group from the University of Nebraska that's doing robotic surgery development looked at haptic response of remote controlled surgical instruments in zero G on the uh, zero G airplane. And then there's uh, the effort that I've been involved that was a collaboration that started 12 years ago between myself and colleagues and students at the University of Louisville and colleagues and students at Carnegie Mellon that then eventually moved to Cornell University. And they were looking at uh, the concept of a surgical dome to provide protection for a surgical site. Um, and this was an idea they'd been looking at long before it was being considered for spaceflight. Uh, one of my colleagues there was a neurosurgeon and, and he was thinking this could be helpful, for example, when he's working on the brain or working on the spine, which is what you see here. But we thought with some modification, uh, this could be appropriate for uh, surgery and spaceflight as well. And, and so we were working on the development of the surgical containment dome to contain and control the surgical field while we're working in a weightless environment. And the idea is that uh, using this containment dome, that contaminating debris can't enter or exit the surgical field. Um, and that you could also fill the surgical dome with a irrigation solution to uh, slow or minimize bleeding and then you could uh, purge it to clear it. So we did um, many, many flights on the zero G airplane. This happens to show the NASA KC-135 angled up at a 45 degree angle, which is the attitude that it does when it's climbing up into the arc to, toward the weightless period. And this shows with the current commercial aircraft zero G that it, it climbs up in an angle and then it goes through a period where it's coasting over the top. And here it gets uh, about 15 or so seconds of zero G, or if the angle's a little shallower, you can get uh, 20 to 23 seconds of lunar G. And if it's even shallower, you can get 25 to 30 seconds of Martian G. And it, it repeats this pattern many times during the flight. So uh, here we are getting ready for our first flight 10 years ago. Um, we, since we were working with fluids, we had to provide a surgical, excuse me, a secondary containment chamber. Um, since I also do work in pediatrics, I'm very familiar with the canopy of a NICU incubator and thought that would be very easy to adapt. And, and so that became our glove box for these flights. Um, here we had a chamber where we could model induced bleeding and then sticking in uh, a suction, we could demonstrate that we could very accurately direct the bleeding into the suction wand and clear the field of the bleeding. Um, and of course, there's nothing like celebrating a successful experience, experiment with a floating high five before the flight is over. Um, there were a lot of different things that we learned out uh, as you do the first time you start to experiments, and that was the the trope cars, which are the devices like these two here that are used to introduce the minimally invasive surgical instruments, um, they tend to leak. And, and in an OR on the ground, that leakage is easily tolerated. In fact, in some cases, it's not even recognized. But when you have a closed environment like a spacecraft, whether you're insufflating with CO2 or whether you're um, adding irrigation solution, you can't have it leaking out into the spacecraft. 
And we looked at the various sources of bleeding. Some are the way the tips of the instruments, which articulate move, and some are the design of the cannula. And we decided it was a lot easier to come up with a modified cannula or trocar design rather than redesign hundreds of minimally invasive surgical instruments. So we looked at it again. We also looked at how do we control the fluid and the pressure and all the interactions with the containment down. And we flew another group of flights with other students. Uh, one of the things we did was we started to come up with our particular idea for a, a trocar or a, a um, cannula that didn't leak. And we did that by adding an additional valve and a slightly different design of the diaphragm seal that the instruments first go into. And the idea was whether you're inserting the instrument, manipulating it, or withdrawing it, you would always have a seal so fluids would not leak out. And uh, this is highlighting the critical spacing of the second valve that was added to help to make that happen. And then this highlights the flexibility of our dual tapered diaphragm seal so that you, as you inserted, manipulated, or withdrew the surgical instrument, there was still good contact with the shaft to prevent leaking. And we, uh, we got uh, quite skilled at designing and, and fabricating the diaphragm seals and the other components uh, in our lab using these uh, two component casting molds that we had. And here's an example of one of the early containment domes with our early crude versions of these uh, cannulas that have the, that don't leak. And uh, here, a couple of my students are demonstrating using a stapler, excuse me, a stapler scalpel tool to um, successfully uh, separate and bisect a section of surgical bowel that was being simulated. Uh, here you can see this picture by a piece of uh, one inch latex tubing. Now, um, hopefully your technology gets better with subsequent iterations. And here you can see one of the earlier models just to demonstrate the concept. These are now the current ones, which could certainly be um, prepared for clinical trial use now. Um, and there's uh, you get some of the other ones. We now actually have a family of four of these, for each one for a slightly different size instrument or slightly different purpose. And we, we do things like we double check the, the leak free behavior of the trocars during the testing. We've done procedures in the fresh tissue lab, um, essentially approximating doing an appendectomy. Um, these trocars could also be used uh, for certain arthroscopic procedures. So this shows using two of them as the arthroscopic surgeons like to call them cannulas, but they're the same as the trocars to do uh, a knee procedure such as uh, uh, minimally invasive um, anterior cruciate ligament replacement or trimming away debris from a damaged uh, medial meniscus cartilage or various things like that. Um, one of the questions that came up uh, that we did investigate was, could we fill the dome uh, in zero G without trapping a lot of bubbles, which would be visual distractions to the surgeon? Um, and we, we did several tests uh, where we were able to observe, both observe and video record it. And it's, it's very interesting. Um, if you can imagine just like filling a glass in in 1G, it, it fills at the bottom and the water interface gradually comes to the top. And in this case with the dome, it would exit the top exit. In 0G, however, you've got a balance of viscous forces, uh, surface tension, um, centrifugal angular momentum, and the hydrostatic pressure, which you have in 1G is now absent. And the consequence of that is that you begin to get a vortex formed around the outer periphery and the interface actually slowly climbs the surface of the dome uh, before the center of the dome even becomes wet. But eventually it does and you get this interface, which if you control it correctly, um, exits the vent at the top of the dome without trapping air bubbles inside of it. But it, it did uh, pose a very interesting uh, 
fluid physics problem. So we, we went back, uh, have done many more parabolic flight campaigns here. We're um, using multiple trocars to demonstrate the ability both to apply surgical staples and surgical suturing of uh, skin inside the dome. Um, here we're testing out a surgical drape material that's used millions of times every day around the world um, as a way to attach the dome to the surface uh, of the abdomen. And here you can see a pressure test and here you can see actually my students um, test applying it to a willing test subject's abdomen, which happened to be mine. And unfortunately, it worked out pretty well. And we've done this many times since then as we continue to evolve and improve the technology. Um, whether or not you can do this in zero G, of course, is a very important question. And so here you can see a couple of pictures from a zero G flight where two of my students are looking at applying this again uh, to me and it, and it worked out very well. Uh, let's see. Um, a couple of the other things that we've looked at is uh, you create waste fluid when you, you do surgery like this. And so in an attempt to maximally recover uh, and recycle materials, um, knowing that there's already a water recovery system on the space station, and there would certainly be something like that on exploration spacecraft, uh, what could be done to capture the surgical waste fluid from the containment dome and uh, clear it enough to make it acceptable to go into the water recovery system. So what we envisioned was from the dome, we would take the waste fluid to a pre-filtering system. And then the outcome of that would be uh, fluid that was sufficiently cleared that it could then go into the urine processing assembly and go through the steps and create uh, drinkable water, which could then go into the IV Gen, which is developed at the NASA Glenn Center in Cleveland, to take that water, drinkable water that comes out of the system and create either sterile water or sterile saline. Uh, to do that, we had this system where we actually did have uh, water uh, in, a, in an IV bag, excuse me, water and blood. Um, we put in some uh, tissue bits to be representative of surgical debris, as well as some pieces of suture and clips. And then we had a, a 0.2 micron filter here, a physical filter, and then we had a, a resin uh, adsorbent filter here. And during the periods of zero G, we would pump this model waste, surgical waste fluid, first through the physical filter and then through the adsorbent resin filter. And then we, we would collect it here. And then when we got back on the ground, we would centrifuge the tubes. And here you can see, this is an example of the uh, source model waste uh, fluid. And then this is after it's gone through the surgical filter, excuse me, the physical filter. And then this is actually after it's gone through the adsorbent filter. And uh, here after the physical filter, you see the debris that was caught by the 0.2 micron filter. So it's doing its job well. And then this was sufficiently um, cleared that it could then be appropriate to put into the water recovery system and regenerate some drinkable water. Um, one of the other questions that comes up, if you have bleeding, what's it gonna to take to purge the containment dome so that it becomes clear enough again for the surgeon to see and continue? So we, we injected some analog blood uh, into a dome in this picture. And then here you can see the progression of doing a purge of the dome. And eventually after two volume replacements, uh, the dome essentially is clear again for the, sufficient for the surgeon to proceed. Um, we, since you only get uh, 15 seconds or so, zero G, um, we accomplished everything that we could so far. We needed extended periods of exposure to zero G um, and short of getting an orbital opportunity, the, the Intermediate is to get a suborbital flight um, that can create almost three minutes of sustained microgravity. 
So we uh, created an automated version of our experiment. Um, and here you can see uh, there, we, we had uh, the opportunity to fly with Virgin Galactic that has Spaceship Two that goes up and creates a little bit shy of three minutes of sustained microgravity. Uh, Blue Origin also has their new Shepard spacecraft that creates three minutes of microgravity. Um, our glove box that we had was too big to fit through the hatch that you see here. So with the students, we went through the process of first mocking up a glove box that would be the appropriate size, and then going through the engineering design and development, which you can see here, and then finally creating this glove box, which has a lot of the same design features that we found very useful, um, but is the right size to fit through the hatch and match the mounting structure on the inside cabin of the spacecraft so that we could do it. Um, but what's unique about this glove box is it actually has three pair of arm access ports. So when it's mounted on this stand and used in um, parabolic flights, up to three people can be working inside the glove box. But on a suborbital flight, the anticipated plan is for only have one researcher fly with their payload. And depending on the spacecraft, um, the investigator would work through the, the arm access ports on the end if it's with Virgin Galactic, but then they would work through the arm access ports on the side if it's inside the Blue Origin spacecraft. So there, those are things that are coming up. But this, this shows how we adapted our glove box and how it would be mounted inside the cabin of Spaceship Two. Uh, here's some pictures of us integrating and testing the different components of our surgical fluid management system. So we had pumps, the containment dome, uh, one of our cannula, and this is our multifunction surgical device, uh, which was created by students. It started out as a senior design project and then became a master's thesis project for one of our students who's since gone to medical school and now is just starting her surgery residency. But the idea is you have this device that looks like a surgical wand, but as you can see, it's got control buttons and each button controls a different function uh, from suction, irrigation, illumination, visualization, and cautery. So here's, here's some details up close uh, of it. And then this is actually um, the entire surgical system. In fact, two different versions of it mounted inside the glove box as it was ready for our suborbital space flight. Um, here you can see two different approaches for the surgical containment dome, and then our multifunction surgical device and some of the pumps that are used to either pump in or remove the irrigation solution. So uh, here we are, I point out again, you, uh, many students involved. In fact, by the time we got to being ready for our suborbital flight, uh, Tommy Rousseau, the other faculty member and I, counted up that 24 students range from undergrad, grad, medical students, surgery residents, everything in between uh, had been involved in this, in this project. So um, we went out to Spaceport America. Here you can see the inside of the glove box with the surgical fluid management systems uh, about two hours in the flight. And this is the power descent uh, when Spaceship Two, after it had been released from White Knight Two, and then here's a picture of Spaceship Two near the apex of its solar orbital flight with the Earth in the background. And this points out where the experiment was. And then fortunately, when Spaceship Two came back, we were very excited to find out that the experiment had worked as planned. And when you compare the functional steps in 1G with the pressures and flows with the functional steps in 0G, uh, all the steps were performed. The, uh, the flow was virtually identical. The pressure levels were a little bit different. And that's due to the, the base of the dome that it was attached to is uh, trying to mimic the compliance uh, of the abdominal wall and uh, the level of filling without the hydrostatic pressure in zero G, it was such that it was still at a higher compliant level. And so when we did uh, pressure ramp in injecting 
volumes of water, the, the resulting pressure changes that we see in 1G weren't quite as much, but all the steps did functionally take place. So that was an important lesson learned and um, uh, certainly encourages us to in, continue to do the work. Um, we're, we're still looking at uh, training additional ways of 3D printing instruments and the application of robotics that we talked about previously. We demonstrated surgically interoperatively with some of our animal research using these instruments. Um, continued, uh, we did work for two years with Robonaut 2 to demonstrate the prospect that that has. And then one of the other adjunct projects is actually developing ways to do long-term preservation of red blood cells. If, if any of you are blood donors, you are probably aware that it has a shelf life of maybe 56 days if you're lucky, um, but it has to be refrigerated. So there's a big requirement re uh, for power. There's a requirement for size of the refrigerator, things that aren't real conducive for spaceflight, as well as the short uh, time that it's physiologically viable. So some of my other colleagues at the University of Louisville have created a way to have long-term preservation of red blood cells by coming up with special techniques of dehydrating them. And uh, here you can see some of the, the planning in the lab. And of course, at our favorite coffee shop where all the high-level planning takes place. And then going to uh, fly, we've flown a total of six parabolic flights with this project. Here you can see one of the uh, packages with the dehydrated red blood cells in it. And you, you can rehydrate it with sterile water, sterile phosphate buffer saline, depending on how it was dehydrated or yeah, dehydrated in the first place. And, and they've already been able to demonstrate a real-time shelf life of two years um, at room temperature. So there's no need for refrigeration or anything else that's gonna require a lot of power. Um, and they're thinking five-year uh, shelf life is quite realistic, and we're continuing to work on that. We, and we also demonstrated that uh, you could get um, uh, a fast infusion rate if you had to do a resuscitation uh, infusion uh, simply by using a pressure bag that you use clinically. Uh, and even though in zero G you don't have hydrostatic pressure to normally make your drip fluid go through the line by applying 150 or 300 millimeters of mercury pressure bag pressure to the outside of your bag with your infusion solution, you can get plenty of flow. This is for zero G, one G and, and two G. So across a range of accelerations, you can still get plenty of infusion rate. Um, if any of you are interested in, in looking into more of the details, uh, we've sponsored a couple of different symposiums that have been summarized and published as NASA technical publications. Um, I've listed the two different numbers here in the titles, which you can do a Google search and it will take you uh, to those reports. So if, if you're interested in exploring the topic further, that's one way to get uh, additional information. And with that, um, I'd like to say thank you from the crew that's been working on this for several years. And uh, when you get a chance, be sure to share your adventures uh, again and again, if the opportunity permits. And I'd also welcome uh, any questions that you have at this time. Well, thank you, George, so much. This was really a lot of useful information, particularly for people in the audience who's working in more medical fields. So I have unmuted everyone here. In case you want to ask questions, please feel free to, to you mute yourselves and ask them. I actually have one to break the ice. Okay. So what will happen today at ISS if an astronaut found himself or herself in a medical emergency requiring surgery? So what would be the standard procedure to follow there? Um, you would try to stabilize them as best as you can. The first thing is stop the bleeding uh, using any number of methods such as tourniquets or the application of direct compression. And then you would bandage it. Um, and, but then if, it, uh, if it's gonna be something that clearly needs surgical treatment for a definitive care, um, they would have to uh, return to the earth 
uh, and and go to the hospital for a surgical procedure to do that because there there aren't that level of surgical supplies on board the ISS right now to take care of that. And, and a follow-up question is, um, okay, I see you know, when we design, for instance, when we design a space systems, I, I do space systems engineering, right? And when we design anything, we always uh, quantify the risk of any system, right? So we say, okay, this is the component and this is the probability of failure. So mm -hmm. the overall probability of failure of the system is going to be X, and we try that X to be below 1%. So <laughs> what is the risk of, have, of having a major accident or medical problem at ISS that cannot be solved on site and that requires maybe landing in a short period of time? Is that quantified somehow? Uh, there are numerous ways of trying to make estimates of that. And uh, there is a group at NASA Glenn in Cleveland that have used various statistical prediction techniques to do that, Monte Carlo simulations and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's what part of the, uh, that one slide that I showed where the probability of injury to crew or the probability of loss of crew, that's where that um, information was generated from it. So there, there's a lot of different things that go into it. I, and unfortunately, I don't have those uh, risk values memorized, uh, but it, it has been worked on and they're, they're continuing to work on that. And, and they're, you know, it, initially, since things were low earth orbit for the station, they had a whole set of predictions for that, but now they're working on for exploration space flight as crews are heading back to the moon, not just to visit, but for extended stays to work on the surface. And as additional information is gained from the extended opportunities to work on the moon, then those predictions will be updated and re-examined to then look at what are the implications for a trip to Mars, which might take three years total when you count the time to get there, the amount of time working on the surface, and then the amount of, amount of time to get back. So that, that is all still very much in the works. Okay, so do you think that for, a, for an extended space mission, that like surface of the moon, Mars transfer, Mars landing and return, do you think that as having this, the capability to perform surgical operations will be necessary to ensure the survival of the crew <clears throat> to a reasonable percent? Uh, certainly the ability to treat um, superficial and, and maybe secondary, but not uh, extreme trauma, yes. Um, as far as appendectomy or cholecystectomy and removing a gallbladder, those are much lower but obviously, as we've seen from the experience in Antarctic and on submarines, it's not zero, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's less likely. But you would definitely want to be able to deal with some kind of um, surface or subsurface uh, trauma to prevent um, continued bleeding that could either diminish the productivity of the crew member or possibly threaten their life. Okay, I'm gonna stop now and I'm gonna let everyone ask questions. Michelle, do you want to you mute yourself or, or do you want me to ask your question? Okay, I will ask it. Uh, so, <laughs> oh, <laughs> perfect. Yes, please. Uh, okay, you're muted now. Oh, no worries. <laughs> Sorry, Mitchell. Uh, so uh, the question that Mitchell has is, uh, how can you get involved in a space surgery at the undergraduate level? There, there aren't many programs looking specifically at surgical challenges and development for spaceflight. But I would suggest um, getting some exposure to any kind of surgery. So um, if you happen to be at a university that has a medical school or a veterinary medical school, 
Um, certainly there's gonna be surgery. So find out opportunities to observe, um, get acquainted with the faculty and the students and the residents and find out if there are surgical research projects on any topic that you can get involved with so that you get a better introduction and sense for what takes place in surgery. And that's, that's very important. You just don't jump into surgical treatment for spaceflight um, right off the bat, but getting an orientation towards surgery is very important. I mean, that's, that's certainly what I did as a student. Uh, I was lucky, I was at a university that both had a medical school and a veterinary medical school, and I had a chance to get involved with projects um, in both of those schools while I was still an engineering student. And that, that introduced me to uh, what it, what's involved in doing a surgical procedure. And then eventually I got to learn basic surgical skills. And as my research was increasing, then gaining more and more surgical skills. And then the process of developing some surgical tools very specifically for what I needed to get my research done and then eventually developing surgical devices or contributing to the development of surgical devices uh, for clinical surgical applications. So it's, it's a slow progressive learning experience. Um, and it's, it's gonna be very unlikely that you would have a chance to jump directly into space surgery, but that would that would be a good path to set you up for when you eventually do find an opportunity to do that. Great. Uh, Mitchell has a very interesting question as well. Mitchell, do you want to, to go ahead and ask it? Sure, thank you for um, coming and talking to us today, Dr. Pantelos. Oh, you're um, welcome. My name is Mitchell. I'm an undergrad student at Embry-Riddle down in uh, Florida, but I was just curious if you see, uh, foresee any kind of post-surgery challenges that need to be looked at, such as maybe uh, increased recovery times or some kind of complications from the surgery, or maybe even micro-G complications to the injury site after um, the surgery. I'm, I'm glad that you asked that question because what I didn't take time to delve into is um, obviously a lot goes into the initial evaluation and the diagnosis of whatever the condition is that the crew member would have before you even get to the point of the surgery. But then when the surgery is done, that doesn't mean everything's taken care of. You still need to have post-operative care uh, of the wound. You have to have pain management. You may need to have a certain degree of physical uh, rehabilitation uh, for that. And, and so your, your question is very insightful into understanding the, the broader context um, of, of surgical care. It's not just the moment or the, the moments of surgery, but it's everything that leads up to it and everything after it to help the crew member recovery. Um, whether there will be some unique challenges that come up related to being in a reduced gravity or a microgravity environment. Um, in, in the research that's been done so far and things that have been experienced on the airplane, on the shuttle and on the station, um, it, it's not obvious what those situations are if they do exist, but it's obviously something that will need to be continually uh, examined for, for the possibility of things that either uh, could not be anticipated or, or the planners thought were very low likelihood of happening. Thank you. Yeah, I was kind of wondering the same thing, thinking about <laughs> you know the whole blood clot incident and some of the other <laughs> things that have happened. Um, I'm sure that they would be uh, very scary for the crew member. Well, they would be. And, and the blood clot incident that you mentioned was associated. They're, they're not absolutely sure, but it seems to be associated with the way restraining straps are used for the astronauts to use some of their exercise devices. And it, you know, it might have been with that particular crew member, the way the straps were on, the extent to which they were tightened down and all that unintentionally caused 
uh, blockage of the neck veins sufficient to uh, initiate a small clot. Uh, but, but the point is, is that we need to be aware of some things that in constantly being uh, critical, uh, appropriately critical, to, to make sure that we're not creating situations where crew members are being exposed to potentially hazardous situations. Any other questions? Okay, looks like we don't have any more questions. So I'm we are really 15 minutes uh, past the deadline for the for this webinar. So we have really taken too much time from you, Dr. George. I, I, I warned you, I talked too much. <laughs> well, that was very interesting. <laughs> Good. Well, so that was it. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Dr. Pantalos, for joining us today. Uh, it has been a real pleasure and, and really instructive for everyone. And remember that we will post this webinar in the ASDSR students' uh, YouTube channel sooner than later, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, keep in touch with us for the next webinars that we will have before the ASDSR meeting in November. Thank you so much for attending, everyone. And thank you again, Dr. Pantalos, for being here today with, uh, with Thanks us. Thanks for the opportunity to be with everybody and I look forward hopefully to seeing all of you at the ASGSR meeting in Houston the second week of November. Please come up and say hello to introduce yourself. Looking forward to that. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye everyone. <laughs>